sister how to think long term in a short term world was described by The Edge as the book that our grandchildren, that our children will thank us for reading. Roman, thank you for joining us. Oh, it's a real pleasure to be on your podcast. What does it take to be a good ancestor? That's the big question. I've just spent four years thinking about that. How am I supposed to answer it in one minute? But I can tell you. I mean, the question, how can we be good ancestors, was one raised by the great immunologist Jonas Salk, who developed the polio vaccine back in 1955. And when he was asking that question, what he really meant was, well, look, our actions today have incredible consequences for future generations, particularly from the moment that the first atomic test happened. We had a capacity to destroy the future, and now we're doing it with ecological degradation and other technological risks. So the question of, you know, what does it mean to be a good ancestor, how to do it, is really about how are we going to be judged by future generations? In other words, it's about extending your time horizons instead of thinking on a scale of seconds, minutes, and hours, extending those time horizons to decades, centuries, and even millennia. Ultimately, that's what it's about. It's about an imaginative act of putting ourselves in the shoes of the unborn citizens of the future. Why should we care? <laughs> I reckon you maybe stole that line from uh, that question from Groucho Marx, who said, why should I care about future generations? What have they ever done for me? Yeah, and or they're not going to have a chance to thank me. I'm not going to be held accountable by them. I can understand it if I believe in God, and I'm not going to be able to reach the celestial kingdom if I don't do right, and maybe I'll be suffering eternal damnation. But ultimately, otherwise, why should I care? It's a really great question, because I think intuitively a lot of people think, well, look, I'm just dealing with all the crap in my own life. I'm trying to keep my job, deal with my kids, or a government's trying to deal with an immediate crisis like COVID-19. Why should I care about people I will never meet, I can never look in the eye? Well, there's lots of different ways to think about it. In fact, philosophers have been pretty hot on this over the last 50 years. I mean, one of the ways to think about it is this. I mean, it's quite hard to grasp the scale of the injustice, of the way that our political systems, for example, give no rights or representation to future generations. They're given no voice. I mean, think about it, that future people you know, they can't throw themselves in front of the king's horse like a suffragette or or go on a salt march to defy their colonial oppressors like Mahatma Gandhi or stage a sit-in like a civil rights activist. Or Even vote. though our actions affect them, you know, they're not here. Um, and if you think about it, okay, there are 7.7 .7 billion people alive today. And over the past 50,000 years, an estimated 100 billion people have been born and died. But over the next 50,000 years, nearly 7 trillion people will be born, even assuming this century's birth rates level off and remain constant. And in the next two centuries alone, tens of billions of people will be born. You know, amongst them, all your grandchildren and their grandchildren and the friends and communities on whom they'll depend. So all those future generations kind of outweigh us, even almost outweigh every human that's ever lived. So I think in there is one reason to care that there's so many more of them than us. Now that's only, you know, this is a, a way that uh, philosophers might call a utilitarian kind of argument. It's weighing up the scales, but there's a whole nother way of looking at it as well. You know, you may have heard of, you know, the golden rule, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, which is an al almost every single religion or ethical system around the world. And we normally think of that as something that is in today's world, I should treat someone on the other part side of the world or someone on the social margins in the way I'd want to be treated myself. But you can also extend it through time. Why don't we treat future generations in the way we would have wanted past generations to have treated us? So like an intergenerational form of the golden rule. And if you think about the legacies that we've inherited from the past, we've inherited very positive legacies. You know, we are the inheritors of great medical discoveries which benefit our lives, the agricultural revolution, the towns and cities where we still live. But we're also the inheritors of very negative legacies. For example, the colonialism and slavery and racial attitude, racist attitudes which have been passed down to us, you know, through criminal justice systems and other public institutions get passed down from generation to generation. Um, or the fossil fuel economies that we've inherited from the 19th century that are pushing us beyond safe ecological boundaries, um, climate change, biodiversity loss, ocean acidification, and so on. So 
if we're going to pass on a legacy and kind of do unto future generations how we want to be done ourselves, how we would have want to be treated, we've got to think about how we're going to affect those generations of the future. We have a kind of a, a moral obligation or connection to them. What did, I want to talk about systems of accountability to future generations. You wrote an article on the subject. I don't want to get yet into those four areas. You talk about, you have proposals, design principles for a deep democracy. I do want to talk about that stuff. That's what I call a teaser. I want to get into it. But even before that, do you think it is more uh, human beings' inability or ability to keep in mind future generations? Do you think that's our greatest opportunity or challenge in considering future generations, or do you think it is more structures and systems? So for instance, is it is our democracy or the decisions we make or our corporate structures a reflection of how selfish I am? I care about my needs. I care about my inner circle. I care somewhat of my outer circle. It's, you know, I guess I'm supposed to now kind of care about the climate around me, right? But I can be ticked off at previous generations. Future generations is a really far circle away. So is it is it a reflection? Is our failure, is history's failure to think about my needs or your needs, is that a reflection of individual selfishness? Or is it when we get into structures, do those structures make us more selfish? Are there our structures our salvation? Or in fact, are our structures our problem? Because those structures, they are built to help me and not help there to help uh, support future generations. That's a really brilliant question, actually. And the way I think about it, I start from the individual. And in fact, not even the individual, but the person you are inside your own brain. I mean, we have a constant tug of war going on in our own minds between the drivers of short-term and long-term thinking. You know, do I party today or save for my pension for tomorrow? Do I upgrade to the latest iPhone or plant a seed in the ground for posterity? And I think of us as having these two different parts of our brains. One part I call the marshmallow brain. That's the part that focuses on immediate rewards and instant gratification. That's the part that gets us to push the buy now button and constantly be on our phones. And it's called, the, I call it the marshmallow brain after the famous 1960s psychology experiment, yeah. the marshmallow test, where a if marshmallow, you could, if you could as you know, keep is the marshmallow the on the table long enough. Yeah. That's right. The marshmallow is put in front of the kids on a table. And if they could resist eating it for 15 minutes, they were rewarded with a second marshmallow. And of course, it turned out that the majority of kids could not resist the treat. And that's given us this narrative that we are just short term creatures. But in fact, in the last 20 years or so, there's been a renaissance of research in psychology and neuroscience telling us the marshmallow brain is not the only part of who we are. We also have what I call acorn brains. That's the part of our brains which focuses on long-term thinking and strategy and planning. It's located in the front of our heads above our eyes in a in the uh, frontal lobe, particularly a part, if you want to know, called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And it's a new part of the brain. You know, the marshmallow brain is about 80 million years old. We share it with rats. The, the acorn brain is just a couple of million years old, and it's actually better developed in human beings than almost all other creatures. So like a chimpanzee will plan ahead a little bit. So they'll get a stick from a tree, strip off the leaves, and use it as a tool to poke into a termite hole. But they'll never make a dozen of those tools and set them aside for next week. But that is precisely what you and I do. You know, if we wanted to, you know, that's what human beings do. We have this capacity to think. I have a, I have a bevy of tools just waiting for my chimpanzee food. I've been waiting. <laughs> it's been, I'm not, I could, and it turns out if I hold it there long enough, I get a second helping of chimpanzee food. Now you're mixing the acorn and the marshmallow oh, up. But, I, okay, all right. but, but, but nicely said. And of course, it's that capacity to plan, that acorn brain, which has enabled us to do extraordinary feats of long-term thinking. As individuals, we plan for our children's education and write song lists for our own funerals. But as societies, we built the Great Wall of China. We built the sewers of Victorian London, which are still being used today. We are cathedral thinkers, which is hopefully something we'll come back and talk about. It's how we voyaged into space. So going back to your question, <laughs> um, my starting point is to recognize that we have these different parts in our of our brains, but our social, political, and economic institutions have been designed to bring out the marshmallow brain much more than the acorn brain. So in the same way that our school systems are designed to bring out our competitive side much more than our cooperative side, you know, they're all about exams and tests and going up the ranks. Um, 
which is not drawing on the full human capacity for cooperation and mutual aid and empathy. Also, our institutions are designed to bring out the short term uh, part of us. So, I mean, just have a look at your phone, right? And have a look at that buy now button. Well, you can imagine a world hmm. where you go to an online shopping emporium and instead of having a buy now button, it's got a buy later button and you press it and there's a drop, drop down menu and you have options. So there might be buy now, but there's also buy in a week or buy in a month or buy in a year or borrow from a friend and you press buy in a year. And in a year's time, you'll get an email saying, well, do you really want that third yoga mat? Okay. And so we know that our technology is designed for the short term, mostly at the moment. And that goes for our politics and our economics too. So going back to the question, I think the institutions are built on a narrative of short termism, a narrative of human nature, which I think we need to challenge because we are as much acorn thinkers as well as marshmallow snatchers. We are both, but we're not just one or the other. If it starts in your argument, which resonates with the person, even before the individual, it starts with me and it starts with you. What are the ways that you've seen people develop the marshmallow brain, excuse me, develop the acorn brain and delay the mushroom, the marshmallow gratification as I confuse all of my foods? Uh, what are the ways people move best to strengthen their acorn brain, their habits of less selfishness, of less need for instant gratification, and build more not only self-discipline, but community discipline? So I'm not a believer in easy solutions to complex problems. I don't believe there's just like one quick fix or silver bullet way to switch from sure. the marshmallow to the acorn. And in fact, in my book, I discuss you know, six different ways of sort of cognitive tools for long-term thinking. So one of them, for example, is the idea of deep time humility. In other words, recognizing that the human species is just an eye blink in the cosmic story. We've been around for a couple of hundred thousand years, but you know, life on earth goes back 3.8 billion years, and it's probably gonna go forward in some form for several billion years more until the death of the sun. And I think recognizing that we are just this moment in the cosmic story gives us a, a humility with respect to the great expanses of time. And at least for me, I mean, for some people, it might make you think, oh, well, why the hell should I care about future generations if you know, the species is going to just disappear anyway? But actually, most people, I think, who do think about deep time, particularly geologists and astronomers do this a lot, um, or even my kids, when they go collecting fossils and holding their hands an ammonite, like a little squid-like creature, which is 200 million years old, get this sense of, well, who are we as a species to break the chain of life with our deadly technologies and ecological degradation? By recognizing deep time, we start switching on, in a way, our acorn brains. But it's not the only way. I mean, there's this fascinating research in behavioral psychology um, about switching on our long-term capacities. So if you ask people, um, whether they would like to leave money to a charity in the future when they die. So that's really leaving something for future generations, people or planet. In the UK, at least, around 6% of people, um, if you don't ask them, 6% of people leave a, re a, a charitable bequest. Okay. Now, if you just ask them simply, why, well, before they write their will, would you like to leave a charitable gift in your will? suddenly it goes up from 6% to 12% of people will leave hmm. a bequest. And then if you say to them, a lot of people like leaving a charitable bequest in their, their wills. Is there, is there an issue about which you are really passionate? Then it jumps from 12% up to 17%. So with just a few behavioral nudges, you can get people starting to think beyond their own lifetimes. And that's what this is all about for me. It's how do we create a world and a political system, a, a form of democracy which is able to respond to immediate crises like a government needs to respond to covid right now of course but also enables it to plan or enables us to plan and think beyond our mortality beyond 100 years or more the social proof what's the term for the second so the, is there a, is there a behavioral science term for each one the first that one sounded like a reminder the second one sounded what like social proof or social pressure I think you're just in coming up with the terms and should write a great academic paper on it. I don't know if there are actual terms about it, but there's a lot of um, really research in 
in the behavioral psychology journals on what's called uh, intergenerational decision making. So anyone interested in that, just put that into Google and you'll find a bunch of papers. And, and I am stuck on a little bit, even that first question, the why should we care question. And some of that is, uh, is almost axiomatic. I should care perhaps because I should care. And if I'm asked, do you care? I want to be the kind of person identifying my own identity as someone who cares. And do you care what happens to future generations? Well, yes, I, I do. Why? Well, I, I don't know, because I think I'm supposed to care. And <laughs> exactly where that comes from, where do you think it comes from? The fact that I care, is it just because I don't want people to read my will afterwards and not think I was a selfish bastard? Is that why I care at that moment? Or is there an intergenerational connection that we identify, maybe because our children or grandchildren, the idea of those things, maybe because it's it's baked in and that's why we've been able to survive for, you know, more than a couple of generations. There is something baked into us. I mean, we are by nature multi-generational creatures. I mean, each of us is at least embedded generally in five generations. There's us, and then we often will know our parents and our grandparents. That takes us back two generations. And we might know our children possibly and our grandchildren. So there's five generations to start with. And in fact, there's some really fascinating um, anthropological evidence about um, societies which have grandmothers um, that have large roles, um, other ones have lower infant child mortality. In sure. other words, it's called the grandmother effect. Um, so we've evolved to have, you know, like a, a grandmother, a human grandmother is alive way after their reproductive period is over. Most animals don't do that. So actually we're really quite intergenerationally evolved creatures. So it is partly um, baked into us, this capacity to think long. But you know, the mention of children and grandchildren is really fundamental because you know, I've been doing recently some briefing British members of parliament uh, about um, my book, about the good ancestor and uh, long-term public policy. And I've had to think quite hard about, okay, how do I talk to them about caring beyond their own electoral terms or their own ministerial terms, looking past the next election or the next headline or even the next tweet? And what I've discovered, a bit through trial and error, but you know, partly based on research, is what connects with people, no matter whether they're rich or poor or left or right, is the idea of legacy. What legacy am I going to leave? And that goes really back to death. You know, how do you keep the fire of your own life burning beyond death? And psychology research shows that once you reach midlife, you know, from 35 maybe to the age of 50, most of us start thinking about how we're going to keep the fire of that of our, our, our life burning beyond death. And that is about, well, how are we going to be rem remembered by future generations? But we tend to think about legacy in very different ways. So, you know, a Russian oligarch might have a very egotistical view of legacy. Okay, I want to be rem I want to have a football stadium named after me or a, or, the, or a wing of an art gallery. That's a very narrow form of legacy. Most of us care about a I think a familial form of legacy. We want to leave things for uh, our family members, our children, maybe it's a house or pass on religion or uh, a family tradition. But I think if we're really going to be good ancestors, it's about wanting to leave a legacy for the universal generations of the future. People will never no, who aren't part of our own bloodlines. But then what's the trick to that? Because some cultures have a very deeply embedded intergenerational care ethic. So, you know, in some Native American peoples, Iroquois people, Lakota Nation people, there's the idea of seventh generation decision making. Um, that idea I discovered the other day is also in the Moluccas Islands in Indonesia. Uh, village councils, they make decisions by, by looking seven generations back, seven generations forward. But of course, I don't naturally think that way. It's not part of the culture that I was brought up in. But the way I try and make that imaginative leap, whether it's to five or seven generations ahead, is I think about my own children. So I've got twins who are 11. Now, if I think about my 11-year-old son today, I sometimes perform a thought experiment while I sort of close my eyes and try to imagine him when he's 30 years old. What's going on in his life? What struggles is he facing? Um, what's going good, what's going badly. And then I try and imagine him on his 90th birthday, surrounded by family and friends and loved ones and old work colleagues. And I go and look out the window and try and picture that world that he's experiencing when he's 90 years old. 
I look into his wrinkled face, into his fading eyes, and think about what he's what need he needs for his life to be good and thriving. Then I imagine someone coming over to him and putting a tiny baby into his arms, and it's his first great grandchild. And I see him looking down at this baby and thinking to himself, well, what would this baby need to survive and thrive for the years and decades ahead? And when I stop and think about that, I think, well, that tiny baby could be alive well into the 22nd century. So the future isn't science fiction. It's an intimate family fact. And the crux of this, to actually answer your question finally, is this. If I care about that little baby in my 90-year-old son's eyes, I have to care about not just that baby, because that, that baby is not alone. It's surrounded by a web of human relationships, family, friend, community, but also a web of natural relationships, the food that it eats, the, the water it drinks, the air that it breathes. So if I care about that one child, I have to extend my sense of legacy to something a bit more transcendent, to you know more than just my own descendants, but to something larger than that. So I think that thinking about our own children or grandchildren or nephews, nieces growing older is a bridge to something bigger. You say bridge and another structure, cathedrals, cathedral thinking. Explain. That's a very lovely segue, actually. So the idea of cathedral thinking... It was a clumsy thinking, one. It was a clumsy segue, but it was a segue which about which I'm mildly proud. <laughs> no, in fact, I'm going to steal that one from you, if you don't mind, for the future. Um, so cathedral thinking is about the human capacity to think and plan on very long time scales, scales, embarking on projects which last decades, even centuries. So the classic example is the medieval European cathedral or church. So for example, in uh, Southwest Germany, there's a Lutheran church called Ulm Minster, U-L-M, Ulm Minster. In 1377, the good citizens of Ulm decided they wanted to build their own church, finance it themselves well, it took them more than 500 years. They didn't finish until 1890, probably the world's longest crowdfunding project. So there they were embarked on a project that they knew would never be finished within their own lifetime. So that's one kind of cathedral thinking, embarking on something that's going to take a hell of a long time to finish. But another kind is embarking on projects which will last a long time once they're created. So another classic example of that in today's world is the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, which is a seed vault in the Arctic Circle to preserve the world's plant biodiversity. They've collected millions of seeds from over 6,000 species uh, in an indestructible rock bunker in the Arctic Circle that's designed to last a thousand years. So it took them about 10 or 15 years to build, I think, but it has this long time horizon in how it's supposed to survive. And so that's cathedral thinking in a nutshell, but it comes in many other varieties. I think we need to recognize that social movements are also often engaged in cathedral thinking. Think of the civil rights movement in the US or the suffragette movement for votes for women in the UK. Most of these are at least half century struggles. You know, people don't know that they're not gonna achieve their aims in a few weeks or few months. It could be years, it could be decades, but they are driven by the fire of their conviction. Um, but cathedral thinking isn't always good for us. Hmm. I mean, a lot of cathedral thinking in the past, in the 19th century, for example, was about building stuff, you know, like canals and railroads, um, hydroelectricity schemes in the 20th century. But just think, enough concrete has now been poured to cover the whole earth in a spherical concrete coffin, two millimeters thick, thick even covering all of the world's oceans. And we know that concrete is responsible for around 10 to 12 percent of the planet's carbon emissions. So that kind of cathedral thinking is past its sell-by date. Or equally, um, you know, a, a dictator like in North Korea, you know, the regime there wants to preserve its power for generation upon generation. That's a kind of cathedral thinking too, but with a very narrow view of what it's aimed to achieve. Or there's a there's a great quote from a former head of Goldman Sachs, Gus Levy, where he said, we're greedy, but long-term greedy, not short-term greedy. Well, that's a kind of cathedral thinking too. So actually to cathedral thinking, we need to add ideals of intergenerational justice or think about, well, what is the actual goal that we're trying to achieve here? It's not just a good in and of itself, much as I love it. Elements of cathedral thinking, as I put on my 
legal opinion writing brain, my now somewhat ad law clerk uh, brain, elements sound like takes a long time to do, to build something that's going to last a long time, something that's important, and something that's beautiful. Now, you can only hope that that thing remains beautiful and it remains important and it becomes on net, it remains on net important and not just, well, it helped you do something that ends up being destructive over time. How do you cultivate uh, cathedral thinking? How do you cultivate long-term thinking, again, in people and then also in institutions? Okay, so it's certainly true that with the, some of these examples of cathedral thinking, the whole point is to try and keep the institution or the building going. It's about maintenance of a certain kind. And let me offer you a kind of, kind of metaphor in a way. Um, last summer, I went to a hillside about 20 miles south from where I live in Oxford in the UK, where there is a gigantic Bronze Age artwork 3,000 years old, carved into the chalk hillside. It's called the White Horse of Uffington. So it's a gigantic horse, um, 100 feet wide, that can be seen from miles around. And 3,000 years ago, somebody, for some reason, carved it into the cut out bits of grass so you can see the white chalk underneath. It's absolutely beautiful. It looks like a kind of a modernist sculpture. Now, every few years, for 1,000 years, the local villagers have been going up the hill to do what they call re-chalking the horse. In other words, what they do is they take out all the weeds that have grown up and they get bits of chalk and they smash them in with, with, with hammers. Well, last summer I went and did that. Um, every year now, actually, the Britain's National Trust, uh, which is an institution to preserve buildings and, 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 and wildlife and, and natural places, um, they organize chalking of the horse. So this is about maintenance, in that case, of a cultural artifact. And in a way, that is a kind of a metaphor for, I think, what we need to do, in a sense, with the planet itself, right? And that's what ecological economics is all about. I mean, I was just taught normal economics 30 years ago or something when I was a student. Um, I was taught about demand and supply and circular flow of incomes. I was ne never taught the basics of ecological economics coming out of the work of people like Herman Daly in the 1970s, which is the idea that, okay, if we want to survive over the long term as a species, well, there's something basic we need to do. In other words, don't use resources faster than they can naturally be regenerated. So don't cut down trees faster than they can grow back. And don't create wastes faster than the earth can naturally absorb them. You know, whether it's, you know, fossil fuels being absorbed by, car, you know, carbon sinks, sinks like oceans. We need to be living in balance. And that's the ultimate kind of maintenance, right? And we are doing the opposite of a species. We are pushing the earth beyond its natural capacities at an ever-increasing rate. That's what we've been doing since the end of the Second World War, what's known as the Great Acceleration, you know, our, our use of fossil fuels and biodiversity loss and so on, going up and up and up and up. Um, and therein is the ultimate problem of institutional maintenance, in this sense, the institution being the one and only planet we know that sustains life. And it seems like there is a potential division between cathedral thinking and chalk horse thinking, that even the idea of cathedral thinking could make me want to extract everything I possibly could extract to create, to satisfy my own edifice complex, to leave something behind me or behind my culture for future cultures to see or for my culture and future generations to see. But that very extraction might be the opposite of maintenance. So where is that dividing line or how do we know, or maybe it's really obvious and how do we cultivate the maintenance piece? Uh, I'm reminded of a I'm reminded of a professor, and you said Oxford, and, and, and this might have been Oxford, it might have been Cambridge. I get them confused in my references, but an old professor of mine who told me a story about how in the dining hall at one of the Oxbridge schools, uh, there is a great beam, support beam on the roof, and outside, the, outside that very building is a tree that's been growing for hundreds of years, and that tree was planted so it could replace that beam. And that's a little more of a main, it's a little more of a chalk horse than, uh, than it is a... Uh, than it is a cathedral, at least it feels like a sustainable habit as distinct from merely an extractive habit. Is there is there a dividing line there? Am I making that up? And again, how do we cultivate that sort of nurturing cathedral as distinct from that extractive one? So that story about the Oxbridge College and the, the beams in the dining hall, uh, I understand was based on New College in Oxford. And um, 
I went and researched it to find out was it really is it true? The case, <laughs> was it really the case that the, the original story is that in the 19th century the 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 roof of the dining hall was collapsing and that there were some woods. I mean, you're pretty much bang on with the story. There were some woods, which uh, trees which had apparently been planted 500 years before specifically to provide the long oak beams for, re for refurbishing the dining hall. Well, I went to New College Oxford and I spoke to the archivist there and she said it's a complete load of rubbish. <laughs> um, that the, the trees had never been specifically planted for that very purpose. Um, they been purchased by the college that woodland a few hundred years before but never with any idea of fixing the dining hall but it doesn't matter because actually it's the fact that that very story intrigues us so much i think you know we recognize that if only for example our pol politicians had that kind of vision to plant an oak that would only be used three or four centuries ahead but i think it comes down in a way, to that your question about is there a dividing line? Well, we see very stark dividing lines between these different attitudes to time, in a way, the marshmallow and the acorn in our everyday institutions. Just think how basically every government in the Western world has been addicted to the idea of GDP growth since the end of the Second World War. Whether they're neoliberal or Keynesians or Marxists, whoever they are, they've had the same idea of constant material advance and growth right now that is a very extractive to use your word attitude it's a very degenerative um attitude to the living world which provides all of those resources and what's really interesting is in the last 10 15 years or so uh, a movement for regenerative economics has been developing you've got people in the post-growth economic movement degrowth movement um, there's a model called Donut Economics developed by the economist Kate Rayworth, which is about s creating an economy which is about thriving in balance and staying within planetary boundaries. I think I saw and her TED Talk. That's right. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's done a great TED Talk. And I have to admit here, she happens to be my wife. So I sometimes... Holy mackerel! Congratulations. <laughs> Was it because of the TED Talk? Did you see it and say, wow, you call her up, you hit her on the DMs? I knew her long before the TED Talk. <laughs> okay. uh, All right. But donut economics is one of the sort of big alternative economic models which are out there um, used in many, many different countries. It's not the only one. You know, I mean, there's people talking about circular economies and, and, and other models, too. But there is increasingly a clear dividing line between those who have a short term degenerative uh, outlook or extractive outlook to the economy and those who are embracing a longer term regenerative outlook. And I think this is mirrored in politics, too. Um, maybe this is something we, we might get into, but, you know, we know that our politics is structured by short termism. Those politicians who can't see beyond the next election or the latest tweet or headline, the corporate funding that keeps um, political leaders trapped in short termism, fueled also by 24 seven media and so on. And then there's the question, isn't there, of, OK, if democratic politics has a kind of myopia built into it in some ways because particularly of electoral cycles well is there a way of introducing a longer term regenerative maintenance like um institutions into it and into our legal systems as well can we turn politics from being a short now activity to a long now activity well let's get to that then what are the ways in your uh, in your article you mentioned four of them a couple of them even in their title feel somewhat self-explanatory although probably still worth explanation another one or two seem a little bit less so if you were going to pick one of those four maybe we'll get into all of them but how do you start building small d democratic apparatus so that it is not only rewarding uh oh i've got an election in eight months we have one in 40 days we have one in four years how do we make sure that those elections reward you know preserving an apocryphal beam for a very real dining hall yeah okay I, so i think you've got to start small is one way to think about it baby steps so go on a journey to Wales. In Wales, they have a very interesting political position known as the Future Generations Commissioner. And several countries now are developing commissioners like this. They're kind of like platonic guardians uh, whose job it is, and in Wales, uh, the job of the commissioner is to 
scrutinize public policy and environment, healthcare, education, and so on, for its impact on the well-being of people up to 30 years from today. So it's stretching beyond electoral cycles. Almost like a generational ombudsman. That's right. So the idea of an intergenerational ombudsman is something that was used in Israel and in Hungary. In the Netherlands, there's a campaign to have one now. I mean, these are complex positions because um, partly parliaments don't like giving up their power to these ombudsmen or to these commissioners. So the Welsh commissioner doesn't have a lot of power. I mean, I know her quite well. Her name's Sophie Howe. She's brilliant. And she herself would say, God, I wish I had more power. I wish I could take public bodies to court for failing to meet uh, long-term goals, whether it's carbon reductions or uh, air pollution in, in other areas. So she has to use the power to persuade a lot. Um, and that is one model, the idea of a, a guardian of the future. Now, when I remember talking to my kids about this and they were saying, well, why should I believe that that future generation commissioner is going to really care about my interests? You know, there's a democratic legitimacy problem there sure. because they're just an appointed person. Because the future Again, generation still doesn't get to pick that person and they're never going to meet. Exactly. So that's why I think there's a second realm which is really interesting, which is the idea of drawing on citizens' assemblies as a democratic mechanism for injecting long-termism into the DNA of This has become politics. my jam, by the way, sir, that sortition, I am now a, I am now a born-again Christian on the subject. I now think that maybe democracy's salvation, or I believe democracy's salvation, will be not only, as I think it was Aristotle who said, that, uh, that elections are for plutocracy and democracy requires lotteries, that we need to empower people based on their humanity, not only based on their ability to raise money, garner votes, be charismatic on TV, interrupt somebody else in a televised debate absolutely i mean there is a renaissance of the ancient greek idea of uh, public assembly people drawn randomly by lot to make decisions in ireland a, a citizens assembly was have been used to change the constitution really so they had a, a, a referendum on uh, abortion based on a citizen assembly deliberation they've been used in Spain, in Belgium, and other countries. Now, the place that I'm really excited by, I hope you will get excited by, is I'm in ready. Japan. I am ready. I'm get ready. Yeah. I know it's called Democracy Nerd for a reason. There are subjects that will excite me that should excite no normal person. <laughs> One of them, I bet, is what you're about to tell me in Japan. In Japan, let me tell you this. It's going to be great. There is a movement called Future Design. Okay. And it began about five years ago. It was started by an economics professor. Um, and what they do is this. They invite local citizens to a meeting to draw up plans and discuss plans for the towns and cities where they live, a kind of citizen assembly. And then they divide them into two groups. Half of them are told that they are residents from the present day. The other half are given these sort of ceremonial, almost kimonos to wear, and told to imagine themselves as being residents from the year 2060. Well, it turns out that the residents from 2060 systematically advocate far more transformative plans for the towns and cities, whether it's mm. healthcare investment or climate change action. And this movement began in a tiny town called Yahaba, which has 27,000 people. Yahaba now has a department in its municipal planning authority called the Future Design Department. They do all of their planning using this method of getting people to put on robes or sometimes even wear a hat that says Homo Futurus on it. And, and this movement is now spreading throughout Japan. It's being used not just in those small towns like Yahaba, but in major cities like Kyoto to get citizens to discuss big issues, global warming, AI, automation, declining population, which is a big issue in Japan. Um, so I would like to see this particular form of future citizens assembly spreading throughout the world. Interesting. Um, so the power of a citizen it, assembly, one of the powers of citizen assembly is that its accountability mechanism is different. They're not only thinking about re-election, they're not only thinking about a power analysis. <laughs> they're there as a jury and they're impaneled to do what they think is the right thing. And the second is the mindset, the homo futurist hat that they wear, the, the mindset as they're trying to do the right thing, they're trying to do the right thing not only for now but also unto the seventh generation. And there's a third thing, which is that 
they tend citizens assemblies when they're done well when sort sortition is done effectively they come from a different many varieties of backgrounds many different cultures and economic backgrounds religious backgrounds that means they all have many different varieties or visions of the future and in fact is, rep and is commission. more representative exactly it represents the multiple futures out there so we know I'm, you're right i'm very excited i'm very i i too yeah. am very excited we will now this will now does this have a name uh does this citizen assembly give us the town again we have to be able to we have to be able to trumpet it to our you know okay. fellow it's democracy called, nerds it's called future design great okay and you can go to their website which is only in japanese unfortunately um but I'm just at the moment writing writing an article for the Boston Globe, which has it's the ultimate guide to future design. So uh, that will be out pretty soon. So people can just try and look Ooh, that good up. Plug. Or the, the ultimate wait wait the ultimate design the the ultimate guide to future design. Well, the, well, it's not. I don't know what it's going to be called. It depends on the editors. Really. Okay. But, um, it, it's got all you need to know about future design and all That's the great. links and everything like that. Or in my book, The Good Ancestor, I've also got a lot of information about it. But to me, it is, you know, I, maybe I'm exaggerating it, but I believe it has the power to revitalize democracy like almost no other model I've come across. It and it's shown results. It's, it's shown, you're saying that it, it's shown results that people have now. We have enough data to show that if I do wear this funny hat and this hat makes me think of it, I'm reminded of, you would call them football, footballers, I would call them soccer players, that when there was too much fighting on the pitch, when there was even racist dialogue on the pitch, they made them, it started a tradition when they would walk out onto the field that we would say, and you know, holding a child's hand, right? And I was like, why do they hold, oh, it's so cute. They're, you know, it must be the youth league and I was like no no that was there because if they think about little kids that might be watching the game or they might be setting an example for they're less likely to say some or do some horrible thing during the game I'm reminded the stories we tell ourselves what we are reminded at the moment or just before the moment of decision matters a lot and telling that story we're really glad to be able to do yeah in fact there is a bunch of evidence showing the impact of this future design method on getting to people to think long term and to literally allocate more money resources to future generations so in one example in fact i was just reading an academic paper about it this morning using future design in japan where the local residents were debating about whether to uh, increase the water taxes the water rates because the government local government was saying that look your water infrastructure is falling apart so in 20 years time 30 years time you won't be able to open a tap and get decent clean water and of course normally we think well who wants to pay more taxes for future generations but using the future design method the town agreed to put up water rates by six percent hmm. not a huge amount but actually quite a significant thing so they were willing to invest in the water infrastructure that they realized would benefit their children and their grandchildren it's just one little example but i think it's exemplary of what this mechanism can do it can switch on that acorn part of the brain so one of the other mechanisms I think you talk about, you already maybe teased, which is the idea of actually future generations having rights, of somebody actually being able to bring a cause of action on behalf of, hey, wait, 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 if you're, gonna, if you're going to soil that water supply, that's not only something that's going to matter in Flint, Michigan, that's going to matter to future Flint Michiganders. Yeah, I think that of the various ways to... Um, inject uh, long-termism into democracy i think law is really fundamental and certainly i mean i'm a political scientist by training about 25 years ago i never really realized how important law was until i started really exploring this and looking at an incredible movement perhaps one of the most important human rights movements since the french revolution the movement to grant rights to future people this is emerging as we speak, and it's of, I believe it's of historic importance. Um, maybe I would say that, but I really believe this. So for example, in the US, there is an organization called Our Children's Trust, a public interest law firm. They have filed a landmark case against the US federal government on behalf of 21 young people claiming the right to a clean uh, climate, a clean atmosphere and healthy climate for both future current and future generations. Now, that case is five years old. It's still in process. They'll probably lose. They've also filed, I think, about 40 other cases at the state level claiming rights for future people. 
and in fact they've had an impact on legal struggles around the this world. This is in our this state, is, right? I mean, they, we've talked to these folks. We talked to those folks on the radio. This is an Oregon-based thing. I think maybe even started at the University of Oregon Law School, as I recall. Yeah, well, it, and, and the, the head of it um, and the chief legal counsel is someone called Julia Olson, and she's absolutely amazing. Her team is amazing. They have impacted legal cases for future re generation rights in Colombia, in Uganda, in the Netherlands. Um, I really believe this is important. Of course, as we know, these legal shifts are, you know, they take time, yeah. um, but they are happening and the, the, there'll be one, you know, case by case. Um, but this is really, I think, a new way of thinking about rights. I think it's really, it's as important, I think, as the extension of rights to women, to slaves, to working people historically, the rights for people who aren't even here, which you might think, well, that's kind of crazy. How could future people who aren't even here to claim rights be given rights but in fact there's some really interesting precedents back in 1993 there was a famous case in the philippines called the oposa case where a lawyer took the philippine government to court on behalf of 43 young people including two of his own kids um, to claim f the rights for future generations because and to stop the government granting licenses to cut down old uh, old growth forests, you know, timber licenses, and it was all about um, protecting the climate for future generations, and they won that case. Um, so this is a really, really exciting area, and another related area is not just struggling for rights for future people, but rights for the natural world itself. So as you might know, in New Zealand, the Wanganui River, sacred to local Maori people, has been given legal personhood the same rights as a human being to protect it from mining and other forms of ecological degradation. The Ganges River, the Yamuna River in India has also been given legal uh, personhood. In Ecuador, uh, similar things are going on. In some states in Brazil, I found out yesterday, there's also some of these struggles emerging. So that's another kind of area of giving rights to the natural world, which is an aspect of embedding long-termism into our sort of legal political systems. And what does that action look like? In the examples you gave, I'm aware of the Children's Trust action, but is that is ultimately a jury and a judge the arbiter of that? Is ultimately it's it's using tort law, it's using uh, somebody has to become a plaintiff or somebody's have to become a plaintiff on behalf of? What are some of the mechanisms of that? How does that play out? I wish I could tell you in more detail. I'm not a lawyer, but I understand that people, yes, have to take uh, the government to court or a corporation to court on behalf of the river uh, itself. And my understanding is that these cases are, you know, they're very contestable. The the lines are not clear. Like I know in Ecuador, people have, you know, been trying to fight uh, cases on behalf of jaguars and some birds um, to, you know, to try and stop their destruction. And I can't tell you, I don't know whether which cases have been successful and which ones haven't. But again, I think this is you know, evolution. This will take a no, long time. No, this is a big deal, and, it, and it's hard because right now there is a fight. Forgive my interruption, but there there is a, uh, a long term discussion, and to put it politely, about the composition of the United States Supreme Court. And one of the things that is not at the top of the discussion, but is it tied for the top of importance, is the idea of how and who should be able to access federal courts. And there were, I, I clerked for a federal court, and the uh, and there was a, a story that I think was not apocryphal, like a, uh, like a beam for a dining hall, about a about a, a very conservative federal judge who would give a special prize to a clerk who could dispose of a case by a matter of standing. If they could avoid having to deal with the merits of the case, avoid whether there had been pollution that had harmed some people based on negligence or based even on recklessness or worse, if they could avoid it by saying that case shouldn't even be here, then you'd get a steak dinner. You'd get some special prize. And that there is, uh, that just access to the court is a critical, access to justice, access to law, it, it, democracy itself is very much in the discussion or needs to be the discussion. It's one of the reasons we're so glad and I'm so glad to be able to talk to you. Uh, so yeah, it, this will take some evolution, some uh, time to develop. And right now, at least in the United States, uh, 
the those efforts have been retrograde. There is a movement away from access to justice, access to democracy, access to apply power to protect people. Yeah, that's right. And I think that's why we can't just put all our eggs in one basket and just fight the legal battles or just try and get a future generations commissioner or just rely on Citizens Assembly and Japan's future design movement. We have to be working across multiple areas. And there's a fourth area, which I think is really important, which in a way is a bit of a solution to the dilemma that you raise, which is the idea of devolution. That taking away power as much as possible from central government, federal government to local people. Because the evidence seems to show, and I've researched this in my book, um, that at the local level, People making decisions in their local towns and cities tend to have a much longer view. Of course, there can be as much corruption and short-termism and hijacking by business in a city as at a national level, but it just doesn't go on, on the same levels. There isn't that same kind of distortion by corporate funding, for example. Um, and so I'm a great believer in devolving power to cities. And just look at how cities have been taking action, long-term action in the way that national governments haven't. You know, in the U.S., for example, when, you know, Trump pulling out of the Paris Accords, then 279 U.S. mayors say, no, we're going to stick with the Paris Agreement and try and keep at least our cities below 1.5 degrees and have policies in that area. Now, those 279 city mayors represented one in five Americans, big cities, Boston, Miami and others. And look at, for example, cities responding to COVID-19. Paris, for example, has instigated radical uh, changes, you know, for example, just turning major roads into public parks and cycleways. Or look at Amsterdam. They've adopted policies saying we're going to get rid of all fossil fuel cars by 2030, right? So I think some of the most innovative long-term public policies happening, particularly on the city level. So I like the idea of returning to the Renaissance city-state idea. I mean, not, you know, I know that in 14th century Italy, Par um, you know, Pisa and Florence were fighting each other to the death. But there, there was also a good side to that, which was about local democracy um, or the potential of that that we can translate into today's world. That more power for cities, I think, will, um, I think, embolden long term thinking. Well, let's dwell on that. Let's dig into that a little bit. Do you think that has more to do with locality or more to do with sorting? And let me explain. So, if we were having this very a very similar discussion 50 years ago and one had the i am guessing social and political predilections that we at least currently have i think we might be talking about how we have to take some power away from state governments from local control to make sure that civil rights standards that are starting to finally evolve are in fact applied more broadly and there aren't hamlets of such obvious racial brutality and oppression. Now, 60 years later, we're feeling differently when we're talking about climate change, etc. And maybe that is because uh, the uh, one explanation possibly is that it's a difference between long term thinking and tribalism. Maybe what happens at the local level is I'll be more tribal. I'm more likely to be ethnocentric, xenophobic, maybe racist in my local level. But at least I'll care about my great grandchildren's great grandchildren as long as they look like me and I can be racist about them, too. That's one possibility. Another possibility is sort of a Bill Bishop hypothesis. He wrote The Big Sort, which is that you know he wrote in 2000 four, but it's, it's been happening even more since, which is 1973 to 40 years later, you had, or you know, 35 years later, you had a, uh, a, 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 me is a little bit of difference in people's racial attitudes in a neighborhood, okay, or excuse me, in the country, it's significant in the country, but you'd have a, uh, you'd have a significantly uh, less likelihood of actually having uh, diversity of opinion within a neighborhood. That in fact, you'd get, you're, I think you're 4% more likely to live next door to someone with a different ra racial background, I think 48% less likely to live next door to somebody with whom you disagreed politically. That we have sorted, that sort of cosmopolitan minded, maybe small L liberal minded people have gravitated to cities and they're, they bump up against the LGBTQIA communities. They are live in a multicultural world. The fact that they are in a multicultural uh, place is either why they came or why they didn't leave. Other people didn't make that same selection. So maybe it's not just a locality thing. It's that, you know, pointy headed, fluffy hearted progressives are, you know, gathering in these places and making these kinds of decisions. Do you have a hypothesis or better yet, even 
even a proven theory about why you are starting to trust city states to do multi-generational thinking? I think you've got a theory in there somewhere. I have two. Um, I have two yeah. hypotheses. I have yet to have a theory. Well, maybe they're both they're competing theories. They both have data to back them up. <laughs> well, let me tell you my general thoughts on, on this. I mean, look through human history at the city. Cities have been really good at lasting for long periods of time. Take Istanbul. It survived for 2,000 years while empires and nations have risen and fall, fallen around it. And one of the things about cities is they're really good at solving problems. Um, go back to ancient Rome. They were providing pub public sanitation, public baths, sewage for people. Uh, in ancient Greece were the first organized grid cities. Think of Victorian London after the great stink of 1858 when the stench from sewage being dumped on the Thames was so great it wafted through the Houses of Parliament and politicians finally reacted by uh, agreeing to finance the building of the London sewers. Uh, it took 19 years, 318 million bricks, 22,000 workers. Those sewers were built twice as big as they needed to be. Long-term vision, they're still used today. Cities are good at that stuff. Um, so that's one, one element of it. And the other thing about cities is one that you mentioned, which is about mixing people together. And again, this has a long history. Going back to cities like Istanbul or Cordoba in, um, in Spain in, in the medieval period, mixing together Jews and Christians and Muslims, cities are probably the greatest social invention for creating tolerance and empathy and community because exactly they stick people together cheek by jowl. That's why when Britain had its vote on Brexit, um, it was cities which defied the idea of splitting from the European Union because people knew people from different cultures and different countries and they were used to it. On the other hand, as you mentioned at the beginning of your question, we can call uh, it a question. Quote. It's charitable to call it a question. It, it, it had a question included, but I did. It, I was a way around the bed. Your intervention, your intervention, <laughs> as it were. Um, at the beginning of it was raising a real question, which is we need to have universal values, too. We can't just let every city become a silo where, you know, one city is the city of racial tolerance and the other one is the city of white supremacy. You know, we need to um, recognize that we need universal human rights or or uh, a shared set of values and that's what education systems are for uh, that's what um you know religions can do as well in some ways by trying to take ideas like individual rights or indigenous rights or rights of people with disabilities and so on and pitching them as the common ground from which we then try and solve problems in our own places like a common uh, reference point. So, in a sense, there always needs to be a dance between the local and the national and the global. Um, and I think this is what we will see over the next 50 to 100 years to take the long view. Nation states will probably survive, but I think we will start seeing city states evolving or something like city states. In fact, there are some already in many ways, you know, places like Amsterdam operate sort of semi-independently from other parts of the Netherlands. And then we'll also see international institutions at the same time, a, a kind of really messy mixture. But that messy mixture, I think, is probably a good thing. If I were going to try to read the trend lines now, at least the short to intermediate term trend lines, in terms of your four elements of deep democracy, it feels like the citizen assemblies are germinating. We do, I'm just speaking in the states and even where I live, uh, the citizen assemblies are starting. You know, at least we have juries in criminal and civil trials. Uh, the intergenerational rights feels that although the idea is budding, the political power apparatus is, at least on the conservative uh, side of the debate, is more than resisting that. They might make an argument about uh, about a woman's right to choose, about, well, we, we will worry about an unborn child, but we won't worry about, uh, we, we don't necessarily want a, a court to have the power to worry about an unborn child three generations from now. But the city-states, you're right. There is, a, 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 mayors and even some governors are right now claiming their power, are in fact, I mean, we've seen the some of the most important uh, climate legislation, which probably needs to be happening at the nation state level, is happening at the city state level where it can matter because that's where a lot of cars are owned. That's where a lot of emissions. Uh, that's where a lot of emissions happen, which does provide this segue.
Is intergenerational thinking a generational fad? Is it that, uh uh-oh, we screwed up. Climate change is upon us. We have had smoke that kept us inside and fires burning down our western seaboard. That's going to get worse rather than better. In some respects, it is already significantly too late. Had we listened to Jimmy Carter, who told us to wear a sweater 35 years ago, we would have had a chance. But we didn't listen, and so now we're worried about this. And what's really happening is we're ticked at our own bad ancestors. And so now we're starting to care and think we should be good ancestors. Is it still going to matter? Have we already done the damage we're going to do? How do we still uh, understand the importance of being good ancestors? What is still at stake? Well, there's a real dilemma here because the kind of changes we're talking about in democracy, rights for future people, citizen assemblies starting eroding the power of you know, your regular uh, representatives, devolution, all these kinds of things, these aren't going to happen overnight. Yeah. These are going to, this is going to ha- happen over decades happen faster in some countries than others at the same time we know that the urgency of so many of our issues facing the 21st century we need to deal with stuff right now and right here you know some people talk about the idea of we've got 10 maybe 12 years to keep ourselves below 1.5 degrees of warming or two degrees of warming um and the kind of changes we've been talking about are not ones that are going to happen within that time period And that is a genuine dilemma, and I can hardly see how we're going to deal with that. Um, In fact, if I pull off my my bookshelf uh, here, which is a book I recently read by Kim Stanley Robinson called New York 2140, and he imagines New York in the mid-22nd century where the rivers, uh, the water has risen, risen 50 feet. So at least half of Manhattan is underwater. It's like a city of canals like venice now i think his view and i I think kim stanley robinson is a seriously fine thinker and writer i think his view is that we are not going to avoid massive calamities there will be tens hundreds of millions of people who will die who will have to relocate because their cities are flooded because of food baskets are destroyed by climate change we can't adjust fast enough and that is the reality at the same time I recognize, I think he recognizes this too, which is that every ton of carbon we keep in the ground makes a difference to future lives. And if I talk to my kids about this, they are really committed to recognizing that these are intergenerational struggles, that they want to have a decent world to live in and they want it for their children and children's children, and that it's going to become the norm to care about intergenerational justice and to have this kind of long-term thinking at the same time as having to deal with the shit that they're having to face in the present, which is, of course, already hit, you know, where you live with the fires, people in Bangladesh dealing with floods, other people dealing with hurricanes, my and if father we, having and if we, to and if leave his a, house in Australia because of fires. Oh, uh, no, the folks, I mean, anybody who didn't weep over what was happening in Australia lacks a soul and a heart, uh, or at least intergenerational awareness, uh, or, you know, care for other folks. But the... Uh, and it isn't just cities. I mean, you've been you've been mentioning island nations who have been who have had cultures of thinking well ahead of time. You've been think, talking even about cultures that are starting to be a little bit of ahead in building uh, in building intergenerational uh, mechanisms. It is, in fact, island nations. You do fifty. You you raise sea level fifty feet, and we're not just talking about oh, New York City is different. We're talking about those island nations don't exist anymore. Is it all climate change? Is there are there other things that we have to so you know? And when I say intergenerational fat, I'm being provocative, but not o- not only for certainly not purpose for sparring, but for for delving. If we uh, so, let's say it's going to be a bad eighty years. Okay, <laughs> we're we're going to have like it's just going to keep getting worse. Mounting the political will, they just we just did so, we just got some math that apparently it is that time travel is theoretically possible, and apparently there's at least now a leading mathematician that says you know some researchers are saying yeah that, that it is possible to time travel, and if we could ship your book back to to the progressive era at the turn of this century, at the dawn of the League of Nations, the beginning of the United Nations, if we could 
send it back to Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Eleanor Roosevelt, if we could send it back to Martin Luther King Jr., and I'm thinking of the United States examples, uh, and we could do that same thing. with if We could send it back to uh, Mohandas Gandhi, and he would read your book and think about, uh-oh, if we're going to do this, we can't only think about justice in our time. We have to think about justice over time. But at this point, even it's theoretically possible, I don't know how to do that with your book. And let's say we finally figure that out in 80 years. Well, maybe they'll listen to this episode. And <laughs> I'm just saying, if you, listen, if you find this in 80 years, you get his book back 80 years behind and let's have that as our plan. But otherwise, I worry about the, about the sort of trajectory vectors of us gathering this awareness, of us recognizing the need of your children, of your brilliant family, and others who read your stuff, and the handful of people who have watched this and spread it to their friends, and start changing our habits, who who live through Australia and fires, and live through uh, the West Coast and fires, and say, oh, we've got to do something now. And we finally build the political will, and we finally build that political will in three decades, to really, maybe, maybe in two, maybe in one. And we finally then, so let's say we get it done in one, let's say we get it done in a decade. And then we finally make the decision-making changes that themselves take another decade or two. And then, uh oh, we've missed our chance. Everybody's done, you've done this math already, okay? And then, and so we just, we have a bad 80 years, okay? Is it still gonna matter 80 years from now? Do we still need to care about future generations 80 years from now? Or do we have to just brace ourselves for a really bad three generations? So the way I think about this, if I understand your question stroke comment correctly, um, well, what it makes me think of is a parliamentary debate I went in, went to in London in the House of Lords last year. And they were debating a, I'm going to try and answer your question, by the way. They were debating whether the UK, whole UK, should have a future generations commissioner like Wales does. And what struck me as absolutely fascinating was that when different members of the House of Lords got up to make their slightly ponderous speeches, they were all interested in different aspects of the future. Some of them were really worried about climate change and biodiversity loss. Some of them were worried about threats from artificial intelligence and bioweapons, things like that. Some of them were worried about mental health issues. Some of them were worried about racial injustice being passed on from generation to generation in policing systems and in judicial systems. In other words, there's a whole bunch of future risks that we are facing. And in each of those different areas, we have different kinds of capacities to deal with them. Well, maybe we'll invent some amazing carbon capture uh, and storage technology that might help deal with the climate crisis, but then we might still be left with a biodiversity problem. Maybe we'll learn to keep AI under control and really learn to regulate that uh, industry really well and maybe we know we won't and the machines will take over and we're going to be in Blade Runner 2049 you know maybe we're going to deal with racial injustice or maybe it's going to still be passed on from generation to generation and be a fundamental problem of long-termism that we haven't dealt with who knows what's going to happen in the next 80 years um, I think there'll be progress in some areas and not in others and we certainly need to be thinking about impacts beyond those 80 years as well we know carbon will stay in the atmosphere way beyond that we know that the ai technology is probably really maybe only going to take off another 50 or 100 years to, according to some people i've been talking to at deep mind really uh, recently um but you know, the action say the, today say, is the still AI, say the AI again, and, and you're right. And in, in some degree, even as I think about it, my my question or comment uh, is is somewhat absurd because, of course, pollution will still be a thing. Of course, population. We, we even you know, we've talked very little about uh, what happens if you maintain hockey stick growth in population. What happens 50 years after that? So it, it probably only becomes it probably only becomes more important. Uh, it, it probably the need for generational uh, intergenerational awareness probably does not calm even in the most uh, buffeted of climate change seas, but only then grows in need, as I think about it. Absolutely right. I mean, the great Jonas Salk, the immunologist who discovered the polio vaccine, wrote this extraordinary book uh, called A New Reality with his um, son, Jonathan Salk, back in 1983. And what he did, or what they did together, was that they got really interested in what are called S curves, zygmoid curves. So instead of a hockey stick growth curve going up and up and up, um, the S curve is one that goes up for a while, then hits an inflection point and then levels off into maturity. 
And what Jonas Salk saw was that human population was following the S curve. He even realized back in the 70s and 80s that probably the population of the planet would level off at between 10 and 11 billion people at some point in the 21st century. And that's what current UN pro projections are. And I think that's probably what's going to happen. But the trick or the key is this, that the world that we have created, the world that we live in was one, for crea one created when population was much lower, when our um, stress on resources and the planet was much lower. It was, you know, institutions, consumer capitalism, nation states, representative democracy were invented in the 18th and 19th century when human population was much lower. And, and we are now in a world where we're having to manage in a world of, say, 7 to 10, 11 billion people. We need completely different institutions to operate in that world, even if population levels off. We need, because of our stress on the planet, effectively, uh, our stress on, on resources, our stress on uh, the atmosphere, our stress on soils, our stress on water. Um, and when you really grasp that, it's a frightening thought because you're asking for a completely new set of major legal, political and economic institutions. Now, when I look at it, I can see no other way than than doing this if we want to avoid the fate of the Roman Empire or the Mayans. All civilizations rise, flower, and decline. And ours will too, unless we jump onto a different kind of curve, a different political system, a different economic system. That is the absolutely confronting truth of it as I see it. If you read something like Jared Diamond's book, Collapse, um, that is what he's telling us, I think. Uh, and those kinds of civilizational studies, I think, are really fundamental. But I tell you, I don't like reading them. I want to put my head in the sand. But, um, <laughs> you know, that's where we are. We're at the decline of something like the Roman Empire, which I have to admit took several hundred years to decline. And we've got to get to one other topic. You'd asked before we started, like, how long it would be. And I said, well, it depends how we do. And I'm realizing it feels like we're in an hour now and we're just getting in some respects to it. And that is, if you tease that out, let's say populate. Let's say we're in a, we're in a sigmoid curve, we're in an S curve, and we flatten out about 11 million, uh, 11 million people. And if you then think, well, m our entire economic system is based upon growth, and that growth has been based on uh, extraction of carbon, and that growth has been based on population growth, and it's been based on innovation, and it's been based on you know marketing advantages and sort of soft value uh, and 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 uh, sort of made up value but that is uh, but that is a cataclysmic impact and requires requires I'll set aside uh, journal any any illusion of journalism journalistic neutrality it requires us to be morally up to the moment we talked about democracy you talked about the uh, your your four elements of deep democracy and so that people can prepare for the democracy nerd exam that we will be having your at least the midterm will probably be on the final uh, the guardians of the future the sort of intergenerational ombudsman the citizen assembly sort of the sortition solution uh, intergenerational rights the climate justice idea of a cause of action based on future generations and the self-governing city states uh, portland being the place not only for pro Test, but also to make sure it's doing its part on climate change. All of those are small d democratic mechanisms. But it seems to me that the driver of much of this is not merely uh, group decision making in the democratic sense, but the decision making of capital and the people who are making decisions on behalf of capital, who aren't thinking, who, who you said, you know, the Goldman Sachs, well, we're greedy, but we're long term greedy. It is hard to be long term greedy. And particularly if you're being long term greedy for people you're never even going to know and certainly aren't your clients so i absolutely agree with that analysis and even though i am a political scientist by training somewhere in my past um, and maybe it's because i live with an ecological economist um, i recognize that if we do not change the economic structures then we ain't going to get nowhere i mean it runs both ways look you can have all the social the sustainable development goals in the world that you like but if your political system is one where you can't see more than a year or a few years ahead because of your elections and so on you're not going to get anywhere but equally unless we rethink what our economies look like and shift from growth-based uh, economies to regenerative economies we're not going to get anywhere either now there's lots of really interesting models uh, 
in this area. I mean, just like, this is just anecdotal, right? There's a company in Sweden called Houdini that makes hiking gear, right? Now, Houdini customers are able to eat their own clothes. And the way they're able to do this is that all Houdini clothes are made from organic wools. And Houdini, the company, has a composting facility in Stockholm where you can throw your old hiking jacket, let it turn into soil, and make a vegetable curry out of your old clothes. <laughs> and they have fed their customers wow. their clothes. This is about the circular economy, completely closed loop, no waste. Now, that company still makes money right i mean it's still in business but it also has very strong you know triple bottom line accounting you know there's the financial as well as the social and the uh, environmental articles written into its memorandum of association you know into what it has to provide now if we are still in a world where companies are just beholden to their shareholders um like the you know wall street FTSE 100 and so on we ain't going to get nowhere right because those shareholders have no interest in the long term that's why we need a renaissance of cooperatives. That's why we need companies giving up quarterly reporting. That's why we need um, all sorts of you know circular economy solutions. And probably to have our second, uh, our follow-on interview to be with your wife. It's a perfect. I, I see what y'all are doing. You're creating sort of this tandem, right? We're talking about why, well, you really got to talk to my partner over here on this other piece as well. I know it's it's all it's all a way to sell her book and my book. That's what we're trying to do in the world. <laughs> get the good ancestor for the long now, and get the 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 donut economics for the big here. To borrow a couple of phrases from the great musician Brian Eno, um, Roman Krasnarik. Is there anything I should have asked you that I failed to? No, I have to say, and I'm not just saying this, but this has been one of the most exciting and interesting conversations about politics and change that I've had for a long, long time. Um, I'm not sure I have anything other, any great other bit of insight or wisdom to add if I've added any at all, but I've really, really uh, enjoyed this. And um, thank you very much. And my brain is seriously buzzing. Well, the feeling is absolutely mutual. We're honored to have, we're so grateful, and I'm so grateful for your book and so grateful for you to have spent this time. The book is The Good Ancestor. The author is Roman Krasnarik. And, and boy, howdy, I, I will now change my story of the apocryphal, it's not my story, but I'll change the time I say the story of the apocryphal beam to the actual story of the cathedral, the actual story of the chalk horse drawing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.